Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guest is Jay Williams, president of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. Thank you for joining us, Jay, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. Jay, it's great to see you as always. Mark, thank you for having me. It's good to see you also. You know, I am so glad that you were able to make time for us today. Uh, if, if we look at what's going on uh, in, in the streets today as a result of the killing of George Floyd, Amon Arbery, others, you and I have chatted in the past about the connection between these events and issues of health, jobs, justice, other disparities experienced by Black Americans here in the United States. And, and other people of color. Uh, let's talk ab about your views of that and your own personal experience um, of, of that part of America. Thank you, Mark. What we are experiencing, as you pointed out, uh, with the unrest, the outrage around the killing of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, the character assault of Christian Cooper, uh, is the manifestation of hundreds of years of structural racism, uh, systemic inequities and disparities that have in the past uh, been manifest in overt ways, in subtle ways, uh, and here we again find ourselves. And it's, and it's unfortunate uh, that notwithstanding all of the history that we have, all of the experiences that we have, that we still in 2020, uh, in the midst of another pandemic, so the pandemic of racism that has been around for uh, so many generations, uh, on top of the pandemic of, of COVID, uh, has laid bare, once again, these inequities and disparities. Uh, and I can tell you that you can't be born and live uh, in this country that, that I love uh, and that so many of us love as a, as a black man, as an African-American person, uh, and not have your life shaped by uh, these forces that we have just talked about, sometimes subtly shaped, sometimes overtly shaped by the forces, sometimes defining moments in your life and my own experiences from a, a very young child uh, up and through you know, my uh, professional career, my election as, as, as mayor of Youngstown, Ohio, and now in my post as president and CEO of the Hartford Foundation. Uh, I have continued to live through these uh, forces. Uh, and there are times when you feel victorious. Uh, there are times when you feel uh, deeply wounded uh, and scarred by them. And, and, and you know, to, to sit here today, I am both uh, angry, frustrated, and pained, but also uh, appreciative and inspired that I get to be a part of an organization that is very much centered uh, its efforts, its resources, and its strengths uh, on trying to address some of these inequities and disparities. You know, you and I are about uh, our similar ages. We're similar sizes. We're both men. Uh, you know, we, we, we kind of look the same, right? I mean, you know, but, but I've had a different experience than you. And right. you know, as we grow older, we, we sort of assume our roles, our titles, our jobs, we're defined by the organizations that we work, uh, we work with. But let's strip all that back. Let's talk about you as a kid, right. uh, you as a young man, uh, you going through your schooling and your early career. Uh, talk about your own personal experience uh, here in America as an American. Certainly. You know, again, notwithstanding any title, any accomplishment, any achievement, uh, you know, I am proud uh, as, a, as a black man, as an African-American born in this country, but uh, can now sit and recall a, a number of instances. As a child, we uh, happened to move to a town that was, um, you know, very homogeneous uh, in terms of its population. There were a handful of black families. I, I was, for a number of years, the only African-American, the only black student in the entire elementary school. And I remember some of my best friends were, were white. Uh, and, and in one instance, I remember we were third graders, sort of just doing what third graders do and sort of uh, picking out the, the girls that we thought were cute with the pigtails. And, and, and I remember having a conversation with one of my friends. I said, okay, well, that'll be, you know, the girl that I like. And, and he said, you know, just so casually, matter of fact, he said, well, Jay, you know, you can't, you know, you can't like her, she can't be your girlfriend, and I'm we're in third grade, uh, and he said, it's because you're black, uh, you know, and, and he didn't, wasn't a racist statement, it was just the thinking of this 
can't be because you're black and she's white. I, I remember, uh, you know, as, a, as, as I grew up, uh, my wife and I uh, were dating and, and coming home from church uh, one evening. Uh, it was dark. Uh, we were driving through, uh, you know, a neighborhood. It didn't matter what neighborhood. It just happened to be one of the suburban neighborhoods. Uh, was pulled over, uh, asked to step out of my car, questioned, uh, and was told that I looked like a robbery suspect. So how driving through a neighborhood at night, uh, you know, uh, not doing anything other than making my way home, uh, I was identified as a robbery suspect, and was detained and, and questioned. Uh, you know, so those instances. I, I don't immediately say those are racist incidents, but it is undeniable that those incidents, incidents are shaped by uh, the environment in which we live. And, and that goes on through my professional career, sitting on an airplane uh, with a White House pass in my pocket because I was working at the White House. And uh, again, law enforcement officers uh, boarding the plane, uh, standing in front and back of my seat with their hands on their weapons, um, asking me a series of questions, uh, having no idea you know, why I was being questioned, how I had been identified, uh, again, having uh, not that working at the White House is a special, but I mean, you have to pass pretty strict security clearances to work at the White House. Uh, and they leave the plane. So I'm left now on a plane full of passengers, any number of whom are wondering, you know, well, what was it with this guy? Why, why is he being questioned? What did he do? Should we be concerned? And I could go on and on and on. And, and you know, I'll give you two, two instances that really, I think, were more defining, uh, even more defining. I, I was elected as the first African-American mayor of Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, was proud and thrilled to serve in that capacity. Uh, but I can tell you that even as the highest elected official in my hometown, uh, I was not comfortable as I walked through the police department, not because any particular officer had done anything adverse to me, but as a black man, uh, even as the mayor of Youngstown appointing the police chiefs and being responsible for the hiring of the police officers, I found myself with a bit of anxiety and having to uh, feel a sense of tension as I made my way through uh, the police department. And, and, and even in the last uh, you know, year, working here uh, at the foundation, proud to be a part of this organization. Uh, I serve on several external boards in the community. Uh, and there was a, 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 some board, a board member that I was serving with who uh, was introduced. I knew him from my earliest days here. Uh, and I, my hair was much shorter and, and I had somewhat of a, a, a different, I guess, more palatable or conservative look. Uh, he had to see me in a few years and, and at one of the board meetings, he came up to me after the board meeting. He said, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. He said, when I looked over and saw your hair, you know, I asked myself, is that a guy that I would trust to run a billion dollar organization? Uh, and he just laughed and, and thought nothing of it. So just the mere change of my appearance, my hair being a little longer, being more toward its natural texture, caused him who knew me for, you know, a year and a half prior to have an initial reaction, is that guy trustworthy? So, I mean, there are instances like that, both overt and subtle, that you just live with experience, uh, you know, and I'm blessed and fortunate to be in a position where I haven't been inhibited, uh, explicitly inhibited by those, but there are so many others who have, uh, and even whatever position that I, or title I have, you know, as a black man, there is still a, a subconscious feeling uh, and, and thread that runs through these experiences. I get a sense that, that these kinds of experiences, subtle and overt, create this, this sort of accumulation of trauma. And it's affected our parents, our grandparents, ourselves, and it can affect our kids. It's, it's, it's uh, pernicious. And it's, it doesn't necessarily, as you point out, come from evil intent. It doesn't even necessarily come from ignorance. It's just within us that we make distinctions that upon reflection are unfair. Um, I'm sure that had you gone back and had this discussion in the moment uh, with this gentleman, uh, it, it, in a thoughtful time, uh, he might have said, you know something, I'm, I'm out of line. Um, so much of this is about talking with each other. How do we, we create those, that dialogue so that people with different attitudes can come together and drop their defensiveness and actually communicate and, and evolve themselves, because we do have to change America. We, and and that's, in each of our, that's on each of us, isn't it? That's absolutely right. And, and you're right. I have no doubt that the statement that was made to me in that moment was not malicious. I don't think it was rooted in any right. race, but I think it was just a, the fact that it has become such a part of our society, such 
that's so much ingrained in the way we think. And, and we all make instant judgments. We all have biases uh, in, 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 in making discriminatory choices. Discriminatory, I mean, in choosing uh, one action or one path over the other. Uh, but you're right. In order to uh, push back against this and begin to dismantle uh, this system, it has to start with an acknowledgement that it exists. And, and for so long, there was not an acknowledgement by the vast majority of Americans that this was a systemic, pernicious, and insidious problem. Uh, Benjamin Franklin said, justice will not be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. I, I am cautiously optimistic that we may be reaching a tipping point where there is a, a significant number of people who are unaffected by this, but who are as outraged as those who have been affected. Uh, and that dialogue starts with the acknowledgement, starting with um, understanding the experiences and, and beginning to uh, know that if you've got a structural problem, it is going to be, uh, in a, it is going to be expensive, inconvenient, time consuming and painful to address the structural problem just you know, the analogy that I often make is just like a structural problem in your home. You know, you can fix a cosmetic issue with scraping and painting and, and power washing and rearranging, but if you uh, look good on its surface and you will think the problem has gone away, but if you don't address the structural problem, uh, you know, you will never ever be able to, to advance uh, as a society. You will never be able to appreciate the full value or enjoyment of living in that home. So, uh, you know, the Hartford Foundation about a year ago, shifted uh, with the support of our board, our strategic focus on addressing uh, these inequities and disparities uh, amongst employment opportunities, student progress or barriers to student progress, uh, high opportunity neighborhoods, wealth building, uh, economic mobility, and our donors have been exceptionally responsive to that. Uh, the dialogue as a convener uh, that we've been able to engage in is a start. It is not enough but it is a start, and, and I think that as we start to see more and more of this uh, in our society, I, I'm hoping that we will you know, push against this in inertia in an ongoing, continuous, and persistent way. Uh, and I think in that regard, we, we may truly be turning a corner uh, in this country. The thing that impressed me about your approach and the approach of your board in hiring you, in adopting some of the strategies that you and your staff have developed, is this really is about investing in communities and making the communities stronger. We're leaving so much on the table in America where we do not invest in people. We don't invest in uh, ensuring that we have a workforce that is educated and adaptable. Uh, we uh, allow people to live in homeless encampments and, and in poor health. Uh, which causes all sorts of different social costs and personal costs, we can actually do so much better. And you've basically prioritized your investments on where they might do the most good. Talk about how you prioritize, not only topically, but also taking into account the issues of race, uh, disparities based in race or disparities based in wealth or in place. You're absolutely right. We as a community foundation have a commitment that we embrace to the entirety of the community. Uh, all of the 29 towns that we serve, the thousands of donors who are in the region, who are now out of the region, uh, we very much are eager to ensure uh, that we're doing our part to add that sense of vibrancy in fulfilling our mission. But we also, we can't do that uh, if the data demonstrates, our lived experiences demonstrate that significant segments of our community and population, particularly those uh, who are uh, Black, African American, and Latino, uh, those who are in certain geographic locations that are defined by their zip codes, or those that are in certain socioeconomic stratifications, uh, if they do not have the same opportunities uh, to educate their children with a quality education, uh, if they do not have the same opportunity to be gainfully employed, to build wealth, uh, if they don't live or have the opportunity to choose to live in high opportunity neighborhoods or enjoy safety and resilience in their community, we will never be able to uh, fulfill our mission. And in doing that, there are always limited resources uh, to try to against unlimited needs. So it's not that we are pivoting away from our previous work. It's not that we are seeking to be exclusionary in our work, but what we're saying is that if we don't have an inclusive view uh, that addresses very real uh, you know, data documented disparities and inequities, uh, then, you know, all the other work that we do 
is 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 investment that is lost. Uh, and that isn't that just isn't that just sensible, right? You invest where the investment is going to have the most impact. Every business does that, right? If absolutely. you're going to spend a dollar, you want to have the best return, right? Absolutely. By reducing poverty, uh, in increasing safety in neighborhoods uh, that are most challenged, the entire region benefits. Uh, the, the wealthiest, most affluent uh, and desirable, and I'm using those terms as, you know, as subjective terms, uh, areas of the community benefit uh, when those areas that are the most disinvested and overlooked uh, are made more stable. I, I would always argue when I was uh, the mayor of Youngstown, uh, when some of the, the surrounding communities would, would, would not be comfortable or would be critical of, uh, of the condition of some of the inner cities. And I would say, you know, the moment you can tell me how a better Youngstown doesn't equate to a better Mahoney Valley, I will stop doing what I'm doing. Uh, and the other thing is that while every community, each one of us can, can reflect on decisions that we've made uh, that, that we, you know, perhaps would have done differently or would have done better. This isn't an instance of, uh, you know, blacks or, or Latinos or individuals who have been uh, suffering the disparities or inequities because they weren't capable or didn't make the right decisions. This is about a system that for generations has been structured to uh, not allow uh, individuals of, of certain ethnicities or, or incomes to rise, to, to be plugged into the opportunities. And then we want to all of a sudden come to a, have an epiphany and say, okay, well, we're gonna do better. So why aren't these groups of individuals doing better when there's been 400 years plus of, uh, of a system that has not allowed them to flourish or to, to rise to uh, the talents uh, and the aspirations that they have. So, in that regard, uh, you know, we are about the vibrancy and the well-being of the entire community. Uh, but you can't be about executing that if segments of your community uh, that have seen that type of disinvestment, that have suffered through those disparities and equities, uh, aren't put at the forefront to begin to figure out how to mitigate and address those. And it takes a long time. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, it's not often politically palatable, but it is absolutely necessary. And the coronavirus situation has taught us that we cannot wall ourselves off from the, uh, the impact of poverty um, on public health, for example, or the impact on, uh, of poverty on, um, on economic development. What we find is that the transfer of wealth into a smaller and smaller groups doesn't necessarily, at a certain point, strengthen anyone. It right. just makes us more fragile and we build higher and higher walls to protect ourselves. Um, on the other hand, you have people uh, talk about income redistribution and uh, you're going to take what's mine. Um, talk a little bit about your views about that idea of objection to um, the kinds of programs that you're discussing based on this idea that income redistribution is, a, is, a, is in play and somehow uh, that is, is really bad for America. That's a, great, that's a great point. And when you hear the term income redistribution, it immediately puts people on a defensive. It immediately becomes an issue to divide and say, well, um, I want you to do better, but I don't want you to do better at my expense or my inconvenience. And I get that that's a natural human reaction. Um, but what isn't acknowledged is that if a group of people have been doing better for generations at the expense of another group of people, you can't just all of a sudden say, okay, um, you know, we want everything to be fair. We want everything to be equal. You have to acknowledge that the wealth, uh, the, the structures uh, that have allowed some to flourish, uh, you know, in a, in a significant way. And let me be very clear. I think that people who have uh, you know, entrepreneurial ideas who work hard should absolutely be able to uh, become successful, should become wealthy, should be, uh, have the ability to make the choices they want to make. I am all for that. Right. That said, you know, oftentimes the ability for those people uh, or people in our communities and our society to become successful has been at the expense of others. You know, you can, you can go back to, uh, you know, I'm not a history uh, uh, professor, but you can go back to, you know, the system of slavery that was free labor to build many of the corporate uh, 
uh, structures and, 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 and segments of our society that exist to this day. I'm not saying we have to go back and calculate what was the value of that labor and all of a sudden you have to you know, start cutting sheets. I'm not saying that. There are those who make that argument and, and I'm not for or against that argument in this conversation. But what I'm saying is there is going to be some pain and discomfort because if, Mark, if you've benefited for a long time by getting not only, you know, sort of your share, uh, but because others were precluded from being as successful or at least having an opportunity, and that's also contributed to what you have, you know, there's going to be some discomfort. Um, so it, it isn't about income redistribution uh, in the sense of using a term to, to divide and to create dissension, but it is acknowledging that there has been a structural uh, systemic uh, uh, forces in this country that have not allowed, not only not allowed, but that have robbed and taken opportunity and value from significant parts of our population. So we have to ask ourselves, how do we remedy that other than just acknowledging it? How do we make sure that there are programs, resources uh, that aren't overnight gonna make up for the generations uh, of the system, but that do put a sustainable plan and path forward uh, for individuals to rise to their own ambitions, aspirations, and talents, uh, in, in, in arguably, you know, what can and should be a free uh, a market and a free capital society, you know, with the appropriate regulations and guardrails. Uh, but I, I, I think that's what we're talking about here. I think there's also an argument, a selfish argument to be made uh, that investing in resilience of, of America's resilience and of America's adaptability means ensuring that that everyone has a uh, has a level of opportunity so that merit can rise to the surface. We've always been stronger when we when we've done that, and to leave people uh, unable to uh, contribute and to build and and to evolve into the leaders of society based on their merit, based on their ideas, right. based on what they can do, their own energy, is, is just leaving America weakened. Um, so I think that there's both a, a values argument and a selfish argument if we can get beyond the divisive language that drives us into our corner so that we're not speaking to each other. If we just talk with each other and we said, okay, we've got this mutual problem. We want to have a stronger America. We also want to have a just America. We have a self, selfish interest, but we also have a values-based interest. I think we can come together and, and, and bridge these, these gaps. I have no doubt that we have that ability within us. Uh, the concern is that we see there are those who are eager and quick to want to be divisive, to create the fear, to create the panic, to keep us from having those conversations, both at the of society. Uh, you know, it happens at the, at, in a political arena. Uh, it happens sometimes in a corporate arena. It happens in our own personal uh, interests. But what I am seeing and what we are seeing is that more and more people are saying, you know what, this is intolerable. Uh, this is not the society that we aspire to, to live in, that we aspire for our children to inherit, uh, that we are acknowledging that this has been a long-standing problem with no easy, quick, clear solutions, uh, but that it is untenable that we continue on the path uh, that we've been on. So to the extent that we start to hear more and more voices, uh, voices not just of the affected and the oppressed, but voices of those who have benefited, voices of those who have been less affected, because we've all been affected. You know, you can't have a foundation, uh, you know, in, in, a, in any place, whether it's a place where you work or a place where you live, you can't have a foundation that's crumbling, uh, that has structural cracks and deficiencies and not be affected. You may not be as affected, and COVID is a perfect example, Mark, that you brought up. Uh, it is not the great equalizer, as, as people have often labeled it. It does affect us all, but doesn't affect us all equally. So to the extent that we can have those conversations that push past the discomfort, push past the political rhetoric, the divisiveness that, that so many are, are, are trying to use as a shield of defense, you know, I, I am internally optimistic uh, that, that our societies, our communities, uh, the people who are our colleagues and fellow citizens can and do have this in them. Um, you know, I'm a fiscal conservative. I do not like overspending. I've always been very independent. I, I, I don't like borrowing. And I've seen some of your uh, fellow foundation leaders, uh, particularly the announcement by Ford Foundation that they're going to take out a billion dollar bond 
and and we we received a question about this in, in our Q and A section here. Um, how do you feel about this this initiative that some of your um, your fellow foundation leaders are taking to go into debt and to um, to diminish their uh, their financial um, uh, uh, means in a very very rapid way in order to uh, double down on these investments in the short term as as a, as a foundation leader uh, is is that where your board would want to go is that where you would want to go How, and, and you've also been a mayor so you've also had to de deal with budget deficits and and stability and and those kinds of challenges. How, how do you feel about that? First of all, let me say I applaud the Ford Foundation for taking such a, uh, a an assertive uh, and, and decisive stance on this issue. Uh, and there is no one right way to do it. But what has to be said and what has to be a willingness is to put everything on the table. Uh, I can't speak to you know ultimately where the Hartford Foundation board will end up. Uh, what positions that we will take, but I can speak to the fact that the board is unequivocally committed uh, that this organization will address uh, these issues within its capacity. The other thing that I say, it's interesting that um, I, I appreciate your fiscal uh, conservative nature and, and, and I share uh, some of the similar views in some respects, uh, but I was in Washington DC uh, for six years. And I heard time and time again that debt and deficits were going to be the end of our society. We're going to be the end <laughs> until the people who were telling you that decided. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that now, in the midst of Crazy. the greatest economic expansion that this country has seen, that started, let me be clear, that started in 2009 and 2010 and continued up until this year, you know, when you absolutely economically uh, are using that period to reduce debt, to reduce the deficit. We saw the exact opposite. So, you know, debt and deficits are tools. You have to be careful how you wield them and execute them. But it is, it is hypocritical. It is the height of hypocrisy to, uh, to all of a sudden become uh, cautious uh, when we have to talk about that, maybe when it comes to remedying or, address, remedying or addressing some of these historical structural deficiencies, inequities, and disparities. Then we get, oh, well, we have to address it, but we have to be careful about the debt and deficit. I get it. But we didn't need to be careful about debt and deficit when it comes to whether it's building and increasing our military uh, defense uh, structure, which I absolutely believe we need, uh, when it comes to providing corporate relief, which I think you know has its place. So I think the bigger challenge is the hypocrisy that debt is bad and deficits are bad if we're talking about trying to remedy some of these societal things but debt and deficits are okay or are a tool when it comes to things that are in the interest of those who are wielding the power. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of, 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 the, uh, of, of our time here, uh, but I would love you to comment on this idea of parties, politicians, civil, uh, civic leaders in this divided time. You've run as a Democrat, you've run as an independent. Um, somehow I doubt you in today's Republican party, you'd ever run as a Republican. Uh, but um, in, in terms of, of what our responsibilities are, let's say um, um, I was an arch, arch, arch conservative or uh, a, a totally flaming liberal or, um, or some, in some other part of the uh, spectrum of political thought. What is my responsibility that transcends whatever that identity is on, in a political base what is my responsibility as a person who identifies as an American? When the foundation of your society, which is our home, is crumbling, uh, whether you're a conservative, a liberal, progressive, an independent, a libertarian, uh, a socialist, you have a responsibility to first and foremost recognize that the foundation of your home and society is crumbling to recognize that those who also live in that home, and we all do, uh, are going to be uh, affected in ways that uh, you are unable to escape. Whether it is you know, the civil unrest, uh, the frustration uh, that is uh, now simmering and, and percolating, uh, whether it is the structural uh, challenges that we face as a country. Uh, you know, I'm the president and CEO of a nonprofit uh, organization, and, and I embrace that. 
I, I will go back to when I ran for mayor. I ran for mayor uh, as a, a registered Democrat uh, who ran as an independent whose campaign was financed significantly by Republicans. Uh, and at the end of the day, what I was told is people wanted good government. Uh, they wanted uh, a leader who would have the interests of uh, the entity that he or she was leading first, in my instance, the city. Uh, not everyone agreed with my views and my decisions, uh, but no one questioned the commitment to the city of Youngstown, uh, just like people may disagree with my views or decisions, but would not, uh, just a, would not be able to credibly question my commitment to this organization uh, or, or to the communities that we serve. So that being said, you know, I think it's easy to retreat to our respective titles, uh, but our society is crumbling. It is literally and figuratively on fire. Uh, and conservatives, liberals, libertarians, socialists, uh, you know, we are all going to suffer uh, immensely uh, if we do not uh, have more and more people who are willing to stand up and push against uh, the dividers, push against uh, those who are, are only uh, in their self-interest. So, you know, to me, that's the most important responsibility we have ultimately is what are we going to hand our, our young people uh, in, the, in the years coming. Jay Williams, thank you so much for sharing the work, your life story, and, and, uh, or part of your life story, and the work of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. giving. Uh, attendees, thank you so much for uh, coming and visiting with us. That's the Nonprofit Report, and we'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.